Good, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is David Coates. I'm one of the co-organizers of this conference. I'd like to welcome you to the first of four sessions today, which will then culminate in the showing of Crossing Arizona this evening. I hope you find the day to your value, and I will ask my colleague, Peter Ciavellis, if he will formally begin this session. Welcome. It's good to see you all. Um, this morning's panel is entitled Immigration Flows in Time and Space, and our goal here is to compare previous waves of U.S. immigration with past migrations and other contemporary global population movements. We hope this morning to provide you the context with which to understand much of what's going to go on in this conference for the, the rest of the meetings. To do this, we're joined by two very distinguished panelists that are very much the top analysts in their fields. Mark Miller is the Emma Smith Morris Professor of Political Science and International Relations in the Department of Political Science and International Relations at the University of Delaware. Among his many publications, he is the co-author of the very widely cited The Age of Migration. Mark has flown all night from Italy to join us, so we're especially gratified to have him here this morning. And we're especially gratified that he made it, given the way airlines have been functioning lately. Uh, Michelle Wooker has not come so far, but we're equally delighted to have her here. And she's the author of the recently published Lockout, Why America Keeps Getting Immigration Wrong When Our Prosperity Depends on Getting It Right. She's a 2007 Guggenheim Fellow. She recently became the Executive Director of the World Policy Institute, where she has been a Senior Fellow since 2000. We want to extend a very warm welcome to you this morning, and welcome to Wake Forest. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Mark? Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to be here at the home of the, the Demon Deacons. Uh, it's really a pleasure. I greatly admire your university. Well, um, my job is to contextualize the subject matter of this conference, which is migration between the United States and Mexico. And I, I think I'm happy to announce that my co-author Stephen Castles and I have drafted the fourth edition of the Age of Migration. So you can consider my talk a sketch of the Age of Migration. I want to divide my brief comments into two parts. Uh, the first will concern kind of our claim. Why do we think that this current epoch should be called the age of migration because there's been many, many periods of mass migration in the history of humankind. Um, I had a very tough uh, Turkish senior uh, thesis advisor at Madison, Wisconsin by the name of Kamal Karpat and he once told me that Mr. Miller, rare is the historical epoch that is not importantly affected by international uh, migration. So the first part will, will really be a sketch of the book. And then in the second part, I understand that Secretary of uh, Labor Marshall did not go much into U.S.-Mexico immigration history, and I thought I'd quickly stretch that uh, too. I promise not to run much over uh, a half an hour. And if I have time, uh, I have a, uh, a list of what I think are the most important kind of comparative uh, lines of inquiry to inform U.S.-Mexico public policy uh, making. So let's get to work, uh, Miller. Um, migration has always occurred, um, and I'll just mention a few of the, the major episodes that we perhaps can talk about at greater length uh, later on. Uh, I always begin with my students with the end of the Western Roman Empire, which was a period of enormous mass migration, and most historians agree that one of the causes for the collapse of the Western Roman Empire, but not the only one, was in fact the, the vast folk erwanderung, the people uh, migrations, the tribal migrations from the Eurasian uh, steppe. Um, the vast Eurasian steppe, of course, 
uh, will uh, bring about vast migrations that affect the Indian Peninsula, China, uh, the Middle East, and, and Europe for centuries and centuries. Most Europeans, of course, have a, an Asian genetic imprint. There's a few exceptions, like uh, the, the Basque. Uh, later on, the Vikings, between the 8th and the 11th century, um, they are the great migratory uh, people, and they greatly affect uh, societies and politics from Russia to the Mediterranean to Normandy to England, Ireland. And Dublin, of course, was a Viking uh, city. McLaughlin is you know, son of a, a Norseman. Uh, I could go on and on. The Crusades, uh, the Inquisition, the mass expulsion of Jews and uh, Muslims to the decline of the Ottoman Empire with the, the vast uh, killings and expulsion of Ottoman Muslims and, and Jews. Um, but by the, the 16th, 17th, and 18th uh, uh, century, we're in the mercantile era. And uh, a feature of governance during this period was uh, that governments viewed their populations as an important resource to uh, conserve. And most mercantilist states in the transatlantic uh, area um, actively oppose the, the emigration of their populations. There's a number of recent good books on that, including a book by Nancy Green and Patrick uh, Vey out of the uh, University of Illinois, and of course a recent book by Aristide uh, Zolberg uh, features this theme uh, as well. Um, so in the, the 17th, 18th uh, uh, centuries, in the transatlantic uh, space, uh, governments like the British government um, were leery of letting their populations go. This, of course, was the era of the, uh, the, the founding of the New World, and there was migration from uh, England and Ireland and whatnot to what became the United States, Canada, uh, and certain areas of Latin America like Argentina, Brazil, Australia, and uh, New Zealand. But uh, by and large, most people were too poor to afford um, international uh, migration. Um, this begins to change in the 19th century, and there's a confluence of factors that will lead to the first great migratory epoch, the, really the first era of globalization, which is driven by massive European migration to the New World, roughly between 1830 and uh, 1930, about 60 million Europeans come and people um, the United States, Canada, uh, Australia, and those Latin American, uh, South American states that I mentioned. So what changed to, for this to happen? Um, first, I think we need to mention a new norm. Um, the French Revolution um, gave us the norm that people, part of their human rights and democratic rights was the right to leave. Uh, governments weren't very happy with that norm, and of course the, the French Revolution was beleaguered and attacked from uh, with, without. But that was uh, uh, something that contributed to this change. And then there was the, the general process of industrialization, which of course occurs first uh, and above all in England. Uh, this creates a middle class, this creates uh, savings, uh, this creates then a situation where people can finance trips across the Atlantic. A major factor would be the decline in the cost of transportation across the uh, Atlantic. So during this period, the general pattern is of movement from labor-rich zones in Europe, where there's really a surplus of people, to um, labor-scarce 
areas of the New World, North America, South America, New Zealand, and Australia. And by and large, this was a very beneficial uh, uh, process uh, because the migrants who moved uh, increased their, their productivity. Uh, they uh, earned more uh, money. And this process then brings millions of people. Here in the United States, um, we made, made no secret about our desire to attract European migrants. This was a, uh, a, a white European uh, republic. We had a vision that all of the area from the East Coast to the West Coast belonged to us by, by given to us by God, as it were. It was a messianic vision that has much to do with colonialism and imperialism, and of course, usurped uh, the, the, the rights of the Native uh, Americans. Um, but this process went on up until the interwar uh, period. Uh, and then, to use the words of Roger Daniels, the, uh, the golden door began to be closed. There was a reaction against immigration. Uh, immigration is beneficial, but it also has uneven distributional, uh, that's the fatigue setting in, uh, effects. And we set up a, uh, a select commission in 1907 to study those uh, effects. Uh, the commission was influenced by racialist and eugenicist uh, ideas, and the Dillingham Commission will make proposals to greatly reduce immigration. Uh, those proposals uh, are translated into bills. They're, they're uh, blocked by presidential vetoes. But finally, in 1917, and after World War I, we get the Quota Acts. And that pretty much closes the door to immigration to the United States. And that has a great effect upon immigration to the entire new world. And we enter into the interwar period of autarky, which leads to the disaster of World War II following the disaster of World War uh, I. So moving very quickly, after World War II, the door begins to open uh, again. Um, um, a, a pair of authors by the name of Hatton and um, Williamson in a very important book called The International Migration in the Global Economy argue that five things uh, precipitate what Castles and Miller call the age of migration. Uh, the first is the monumental shift first identified by the Argentinian scholars, the husband and wife, Lattice and Lattice. Circa 1970, uh, Latin America goes from a net um, importer of people to a net exporter of people. And today it remains a next uh, exporter. And basically that's because Latin American growth does not keep up with North American and also European growth. So that you have next exportation of people to largely to North America, but in recent years also to Southern Europe. Italy, Portugal, and uh, Spain. So that's the first big shift. The second big shift is the virtual drying up of emigration from Northern, Western, and Southern Europe to North America and the New World. Uh, as late as 1965, our, our Congress, uh, enlightened as it is, would would reform our immigration law with the idea that post-1965 would be largely European. But of course, that was not uh, the case. That was not the first and only miscalculation by our, our Congress. In fact, that's the pattern. The pattern is for miscalculation and unexpected outcomes, as we'll see, I think, in coming uh, days. Um, a, a third important point was the emergence of new zones of migration. Uh, it's only after 1965 that we get 
truly global migration uh, and, and even the involvement of Africans. Prior to, uh, back during that first era of, of globalization, Africans largely did not participate in international migration. They may, they may have moved internationally, but they stayed within the continent of Africa for the most part, and that was because of the poverty uh, constraint. Uh, the fourth major change that occurs um, is the development of a major locus of migration in the Middle East. These are the Gulf states, the oil-rich Gulf states, which bring in millions and millions and millions of temporary foreign workers, particularly from India and Pakistan. Uh, a final point that Hatton and Williamson makes involves Eastern Europe. Uh, with the collapse of communist systems, uh, you, you get a large out-migration. And so East Europeans flood into Western Europe and Southern Europe and uh, North America and some other places as well. But be careful. I'm just back from Poland and the Ukraine, and though Poland is going through what we call migration transition. That is to say, it's being transformed very rapidly from a country uh, characterized by emigration abroad to becoming an immigration land in its own right. So Castles and Miller identify six general tendencies that define, as it were, the age of migration. The first is the globalization of migration. All areas of the world are greatly involved in international uh, migration. The second is the increased volume of migration. We think, according to UN statistics, that there is roughly 200 million uh, international migrants today. That's only two or three percent of the total world uh, population. Um, but most people around the world are now directly affected by international migration in one way or another. And this is something new. It's a, it's a global phenomenon affecting everybody, but we should be clear that international migration is not inexorable. It can, it can be reduced, and it has been reduced in certain circumstances. Um, the third feature is the increasing complexity of migration. Countries no longer are just guesswork or receiving countries or lands of emigration. Uh, most countries have multiple forms of migration. There's great complexity involved in migration uh, policy, and that uh, is different than what we, we think than what prevailed beforehand. Feminization of migration, well, there's always been women in migration, but now we have flows that are almost entirely made up of women, like uh, female domestic workers in the Middle East. Um, the fifth, and perhaps the most important characteristic of the age of migration, is the growing political saliency of migration. It seems everywhere around the world, domestic politics are roiled by migratory questions. Where migration are, is, is a huge issue in bilateral and multilateral relations. Last year, even the United Nations got involved in uh, migration. And of course, we saw in the US-Mexican context, um, President Bush and President Fox um, giving new significance to migration in U.S.-Mexico uh, relations. I call this the, the U.S.-Mexico immigration honeymoon of 2001. In the new edition of the book, we're going to add a sixth defining feature, and this is the diffusion of uh, uh, migration transition. More and more lands are being transformed from lands of emigration into lands of immigration. And these countries would include Mexico. They would include Spain, Turkey, the Republic of Korea, Thailand. There's a list of about 50 such countries. 
Okay, so the U.S.-Mexico relation um, and the impasse that characterizes um, the relationship for the, for the last 30 years, my entire professional career, okay? I've been working on this area. I've been uh, personally involved in it. Um, it is actually very typical of the global situation. There's a global impasse on migration between the North and the South. Mexico and the United States happens to be the most significant relationship within that global question. Now, very quickly, um, it's very interesting to, to read um, the history books coming out today. Um, read um, Robert Kagan, the, the leading neoconservative historian, his new book on the history of US, um, uh, US foreign policy up until this 1900. Um, look at the images of Mexico and how the Americans treat Mexico. It's a very, we have a very bellicose attitude towards Mexico. I, I mean, I, I hate to, to say this, but it seems to be uh, the reality. The new book by Zoberg also bears this out. There wasn't much Mexican migration to the United States until about 1900. But uh, what, I've, what we've learned recently is that even before the first Bracero program, which begins in 1917, there was very extensive um, contracting of Mexican workers to work in agriculture and in other jobs. Zolberg estimates there may have been up to 500,000 Mexicans in the United States prior to 1917. In the First World War, um, we decide, the Secretary of Labor waives the Foreign Act forbidding contract labor, and we begin to recruit Mexicans um, because of a perceived uh, labor shortage due to the war. This is the first Bracero policy. It's very important for us to understand that the U.S. government really initiated Mexican labor migration to the United States. Um, later on in the 1930s, there will be a repatriation of Mexicans that doesn't figure very importantly in our U.S. history books, but which did took place. Uh, in my eyes, in 1942 begins a very important era the, the second Bracero era, which will last until 1964. During that time period, about five million Mexican workers are admitted to temporary jobs in the United States. At the same time, about seven million Mexican workers are uh, removed from the United States. Um, there, there's so much to talk about. Um, I'll just mention in passing uh, something that's largely forgotten today is that during the first Bracero program, the Mexican government proposed that the United States government adopt what are called employer sanctions. That is to say laws to penalize um, illegal employment of uh, aliens because so many Texas uh, growers were ignoring the terms of the bilateral agreement. So Mexico hoped that employer sanctions would uh, increase compliance with the terms of the bilateral agreement. Um, this became a, a cause celebre for progressives in the United States. And in 1952, the two houses of Congress adopted employer sanctions in the bills. But the bills went to a, uh, a committee, um, and Lyndon Baines Johnson headed that uh, committee. And he rewrote the law to make sure that employers were not punishable. Uh, and, and so this is called the, um, the uh, Texas Proviso to the INA of 1952. And it was not illegal for employers in the United States to hire uh, aliens who were unauthorized to work in the United States until 1986. By the 1970s, there's growing concern over illegal Mexican migration to the United States. We set up 
a select commission headed by Father Hesburgh of Notre Dame to make recommendations to Congress. And that commission recommends that we, uh, a kind of a carrot and stick approach, that we legalize illegal uh, persons in the United States, but that we create a credible employer sanction regime after the legalization, the carrot and the stick. And amongst the recommendations was that um, there should be introduced a counterfeit resistant employment eligibility uh, document. That was recommended by the Select Commission. It was ignored by Congress. There was intense opposition to employer sanctions. We didn't get a law adopted until 1986. That law legalized three million aliens, most of whom were Mexicans, but we never got a credible employer sanction regime. It was aborted, really, from the beginning. Uh, that was the deal. Congress did not consummate it. Congress did not carry it through, and basically, um, uh, IRCA uh, never had a chance of uh, curbing illegal uh, migration. Uh, shortly thereafter, and my time is up, we would take NAFTA. Uh, NAFTA was supposed to be all about curbing illegal migration. Um, well, it hasn't worked, okay, it's very clear. Uh, the select commission, or the uh, second commission will make recommendations. This is with the Commission on Immigration Reform. They recommend that we build a credible employer sanction regime. Congress totally ignores them. Uh, instead, we, we see this disastrous approach to uh, building walls along the border. Everybody knew this would take many lives. 1996, we get another law. Once again, they ignore employer sanctions. There's been no enforcement of employer sanctions uh, to speak of. Instead, there's further reinforcement of the wall. And that brings us up to re recent memory, that is to say, the, the honeymoon, the ab abortive honeymoon of 2001. I simply have no longer uh, the time to go into uh, uh, detail. So I will save uh, maybe some of my concluding remarks and some of my um, observations about comparisons for later on. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> it's a fantastic contextual background for us to sort of set the stage for the rest of the conference. Um, I did want to note, um, also I failed to note in my introductory comments, we will have a question and answer session following the presentation, so um, we'd like to encourage a lot of interchange. Um, Michelle, I'll now turn it over to you. Great, thank you. It's, it's a little intimidating to go after someone uh, whose, whose work is, is so influential and respected and, and uh, whose book I was uh, actually adopted for a, for a course as well. So it's, it's a real honor to be with, with you here, uh, Mark. Um, he's given us a fabulous overview and I'd like to hone in on, on one aspect of the changing context of migration today and that's what do we do with the people who, who, who migrate? How are they treated in the countries where they are hosted? We've got uh, almost 3% of the world's population living in other countries. Uh, in places like the United States, about 12% of the population here is, is foreign born. Uh, about 4% uh, don't have any papers. And so there's actually a quite big part of the population uh, that's, that's got a very, very different status from the, the established American citizens. And I'd like to talk a little bit about the implications of that for this country and also about the, the struggles uh, that other countries are dealing with around the world. Uh, who is a citizen? How do you decide who's a citizen? Uh, what's the line between what a citizen is, has the rights to and that a non-citizen has rights to? Uh, and this is actually a, a huge, huge dilemma around the world. Uh, countries are adopting all sorts of ways of dealing with this question, some of them quite unusual. It would be a lot surpri very surprising to Americans. Uh, talking about this issue, I often find people say, well, this is what citizenship is about, and that's the way it is. And uh, there's not quite such a consciousness that it's only fairly recently that we've come to this understanding of what citizenship is. And I think in the, in the coming years, it's going to become a bigger and bigger debate around the world. Uh, what, what are the implications of the rules that we set up for citizenship? 
Um, just to give a, a sense of, of how much these, these laws change and also how important it is, um, the League of Nations during its short life uh, commissioned uh, three huge uh, global studies of the, sort of the three biggest issues of the time. And one of them was uh, nationalities laws. Uh, and uh, Harvard Law School uh, was sort of, sort of the, the, the spearheading of this report. And uh, one sentence from this stands out. I think it could be spoken today just as well as, as in 1929 when this report was published. Um, but they've said, in fact, there seem to be no laws which are more fluid and subject to change than nationality laws. Of course, immigration touches on just about every other issue in society that you can think of on, on, on health, on, on social services, on, on education, on social cohesion, on economics. And I think it goes really down to the question of what is a nation? What does nationhood mean? What's the relationship of one nation to other nations? And if we don't look at this question, we're not going to be able to come up with effective policies. Uh, to think about this properly, I think we need to go back uh, quite far in time and realize that, that the concept of citizenship has changed uh, dramatically. Uh, the word citizen uh, actually comes from, from city, or the city-state, which uh, was the, the, uh, the unit of government at the, at the time that the concept started uh, to come together. And then you have, uh, you have uh, uh, the evolution to, to empires, where you, you have movement of, of large groups of, of people within, within empires, and the, the empires were so vast that it was really the, the within empire movements that were almost even more important uh, until the, the empires started uh, clashing and the borders started shifting. It wasn't really until the 19th century that our current idea of the, the nation state uh, came to be uh, important, and not coincidentally, that was about the same time that what we now recognize as a passport uh, came into very, very wide use, although it had sort of passports had been in use uh, for quite some time before that. Uh, but uh, you know, as, as Mark mentioned, originally uh, passports, immigration laws were really much more concerned with keeping people from leaving. Uh, I, I look now at the, the walls that are going up around the world and think about the wall that dominated so many people's uh, uh, consciousness for so long, the Ber Berlin Wall, uh, that was intended to keep, keep people in instead of out. And it, in fact, uh, shortly after uh, uh, Congress passed the, the border fence idea for the first, uh, for the first time in the, the first Sensenbrenner bill, I went to Berlin. The first thing, you know, coming in from the airport, the, the taxi driver you know, takes you past the, the Brandenburg Gate, and the first thing he says was, you know, you guys are putting up a wall? We're so proud that we took ours down. Uh, and so it's really been uh, very recently that walls have gone up to, to keep people out. Um, during the 20th century, there was a huge question of uh, how do people give up their old nationality. Uh, during the First World War, there was a lot of concern in the United States over the, uh, the largest minority in states at that time uh, who were technically subjects of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, at which we, of course, were, were at war. Um, and uh, there was a lot of suspicion uh, against those people, a lot of, uh, a lot of browbeating, a, a lot of harassment, and there was a real movement to prove your, your loyalty to the United States. Uh, during the course of the 20th century, uh, the question of dual citizenship was also uh, wrestled with. Uh, we think of dual citizenship as a, a fairly new thing. It was really only in the 1960s uh, that the US Supreme Court ruled uh, that yes, this was something that was allowed, particularly in cases when people couldn't give up their old uh, citizenship, the other countries simply wouldn't, wouldn't let it go. Um, another change that we've seen is that uh, the rights of citizens have expanded uh, greatly, uh, certainly with the, with the creation of the United States, uh, democracy movements uh, during the, the course of the uh, 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, and also, since the beginning of, of the 20th century, the, the services, so social services, edu uh, public education, uh, other things provided by states uh, to the people living with them expanded. And of course, one of the biggest debates about immigration today 
is uh, involved in questions of health care, of education, uh, of uh, social services. Uh, should we be providing these things to immigrants, uh, whether they are legal, illegal, whatever their status is? Um, should, uh, should citizens be the only ones to get these services? It brings you to the question of, of why do we provide these services? Uh, certainly we wouldn't have started them if it wasn't uh, in the country's interest to get them in, in the first place. Um, and the, it's, it's a big, big, big debate that needs to be resolved. Um, also, uh, recognizing, uh, as Mark said, the change of migration to the point where uh, about half of migration from the latest study I've seen is actually uh, within develop or from one developing country to the other within the, the global south as it's called and a lot of these countries are still uh, in a state where they don't afford the the same democratic rights to citizens uh, that other countries do so there you'll see that the line often be between the uh, citizens and non-citizens uh, is, 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 is not quite so distinct, but it's not because citizens have more rights, it's actually because they have less. Um, I was at a conference in Seville in March, uh, sponsored by the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. We were talking about Mexico and about the many countries in the world uh, that uh, previously were, were mainly sending countries and are now receiving countries. And a, a very distinguished participant from Mexico said, well, you know, you think you treat Mexicans badly in the United States. You should see how we treat Guatemalans and Salvadorians. And so the, the question of the rights of citizens, I think, is also very, very important uh, to the discussion of migration. Um, also interestingly, in the, in the mid-19th century, when uh, passports started to be used more widely, which is, of course, with the solidification of the idea of, of, the, of the nation state, uh, another important change happened. Uh, until the mid-19th century, uh, some countries would actually issue passports to citizens of other countries. Uh, you know, France would issue, issue them to uh, people from England and, and vice versa. And that actually uh, stopped and the, the, the emphasis changed to really working on keeping people out uh, after an assassination attempt uh, perpetuated by someone uh, who come in on a, on a false passport. Um, there's another uh, category in between citizenship and non-citizenship uh, that I think is becoming more and more important, which is uh, denizenship. Uh, first reference to this was actually in, uh, in the early 16th century when uh, England uh, issued the, what is called the Letter Patent of Denization. And that's basically, I guess, almost the equivalent of today's uh, green card, uh, the legal permanent resident status, uh, is for foreigners giving them a certain sort of privileged status uh, that uh, is more than non-citizens, less than citizens. Uh, today, you see, see with, with mass migration, uh, large categories of, of people uh, who, who are denizens, uh, children who are born abroad to emigres, uh, refugees and asylees, uh, guest workers, other long-term workers. We've seen the, the expansion of this sort of third category of people who are not going to be allowed to naturalize. They're never going to be allowed to belong completely, yet uh, they're, they're still allowed to be, to be present. How are countries dealing with some of these issues? Uh, I thought I'd share with you some of the, the solutions, some in one direction, some in the other one, uh, around the world, and some of the discussions that are going on uh, they're very, very similar to some of the discussions we're having in the United States, although with, uh, with different uh, solutions. Uh, Germany, as uh, many of you know, for, uh, from the 50s on, had a very extensive guest worker program with the idea people would come temporarily and then they would go back, uh, many of them, uh, to Turkey. And uh, from that, uh, people came to understand that there's nothing more permanent than a temporary worker. Uh, Germany uh, has, has been thinking hard about this lately, they recently changed their laws to start making it uh, possible for uh, the, the children of some of these uh, guest workers to become German citizens. They unfortunately found that participation has not been what they would like. In many cases it's because of very, very practical issues, uh, like uh, whether people want to be able to inherit land in their home country or not. Uh, this is a question in the United States for a lot of uh, Latin Americans whose countries have been very aggressive since the early 1990s in offering dual citizenship and trying to, to re-engage people who have left. 
uh, the questions of when you fly back to your home country, you might be charged a, a higher entry tax uh, if you are not a citizen of that country. You might not be allowed to invest in a business. You might not be allowed to own land. And uh, so this is, this is actually a practical matter for many people. In the United States, it's the opposite. Uh, as this country has talked about, uh, restricting the benefits that are offered to even to, to legal immigrants, uh, some people are becoming citizens either out of fear or out of, out of uh, practicality. Certainly some of the changes in our regime have made people much more vulnerable uh, to, uh, to, to mishaps, such as I've, I've heard of people who uh, have been wrongly accused of shoplifting, uh, were told by their attorneys that it was uh, much easier to just uh, plead guilty, get away with a little slap on the fist. It would be much cheaper financially than to fight something, even though people were innocent. Uh, people would do that before 1996 when the laws changed, and uh, retroactively, uh, we imposed uh, rules that if, you, if you're convicted of a crime of a certain level, you are going to be deported. Uh, so a lot of people are, are really, uh, really becoming citizens out of, out of fear, and we really need to ask ourselves, do we want people to become citizens because uh, they feel like they're Americans, because they're, they're part of a country, or, or because they're, they're just uh, looking at it as a practical matter? Um, uh, the, the former colonies, the, the, the British Empire, uh, saw some of their uh, citizens rights uh, revoked um, sort of from the, from the 60s on. And uh, many of those countries also are seeing uh, emigration, people who go off to the United States who grow up in a very different culture and you know, want to come back. And they've set up systems to prevent some of those people from coming back and have set up a very interesting arrangement whereby uh, being a citizen is only an administrative measure. It means the right to carry a British overseas territory passport. But you can actually be a citizen. For, for example, some of these um, uh, the emigres uh, hold this, this passport. They're technically citizens. But they're actually not allowed to vote in, uh, in many places in the English-speaking Caribbean uh, because to vote, you have to be something called a, a belonger. And that's more like what most of us think of as a citizen. Um, with dual citizenship, you're seeing a lot of very interesting new forms of political participation. Uh, a lot of my original work was in the Dominican Republic, and uh, when I went down to, to cover some of the elections as a journalist, uh, I would go down to the, the, the hotel, to the breakfast buffet uh, in the morning, and sit down next to people who I knew from New York City as you know, state assemblymen, city council members. You know, half of New York City was down there. And interestingly, it was the people who were most involved in uh, in civil society and political participation in New York City who were also most involved in the political life in the countries of, of origin. Uh, I interviewed a, a sitting city council member in Hackensack, New Jersey, uh, who was a Colombian. And Colombia fairly recently established a seat in, uh, in its Senate uh, that was reserved for people from the diaspora population. And so he actually made a lot of news by running for that seat while he was a sitting council member in New Jersey. Um, although when, when I talked to him about it, he says, you know, I never would have done it if I had any idea that, that I might have won, which of course he didn't. He said, I just was, was shocked that, that so few other Colombians stood up and uh, wanted to run for that office. So I did it really to shame them into, into participating. It would have been a very big surprise if he had won, but this raises a lot of issues for dual citizens uh, who might hold office in other countries. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, implications for uh, allegiance, loyalties, um, if there's a, any sort of you know, conflict of interest between the two countries. A lot of emigres from the United States uh, to the United States have returned to their uh, countries of origin and held very important uh, political offices. Um, uh, the Lithuanian president in 1997 was actually a former United States government uh, official. Um, overseas absentee voting, which is something that, that Americans have taken for granted for a very, very long time, uh, is quite new in a lot of countries. Um, Dominican Republic, uh, Mexico, Ecuador, the Philippines uh, have only recently uh, begun to allow it. Uh, some countries have gone even further. Colombia, as I mentioned, um, and uh, Cape Verde uh, reserve seats in their national legislatures 
for uh, dual citizens. Uh, in 2006, uh, Italians who were living abroad elected uh, 12 deputies and six senators uh, who were their offices were specifically created to represent areas of the world that were outside of Italy. Uh, at the same time, that there's a question of uh, how do you make someone become a citizen? You're seeing many more countries, particularly in the last few years, adopting citizenship tests, uh, much like the United States has had for a long time. Uh, interestingly, you, you read a lot about the new citizenship test in this country uh, that's been quite controversial uh, because of its, its change in, in, in concept. Some people think it's going to be uh, more difficult than the previous tests. Um, if you look at the evolution of the test, uh, it's very interesting. At the very beginning, it was all the regional immigration officials who were allowed to decide, uh, often with a little palm greasing or uh, other uh, irregular measures, who was allowed to, to come in and uh, naturalize. Uh, so to prevent that, a set of questions were instituted uh, in a lot of these places. And uh, in the 80s, uh, Washington pulled all these questions together into a big batch, the 100 questions, uh, some of which were, were quite ridiculous. One of them was, um, what form did you fill out in order to apply for naturalization? Which I thought was an amazing judge of uh, your ability and your, your commitment to the United States and, and your suitability <laughs> as the United States citizen. Uh, my understanding was that that was put in there to, to make it easy. It's sort of a judge of, of English. Um, and some of them were trick questions, actually. I'd ask all my uh, you know, academic friends, uh, what were the original 13 states? And everyone was like, uh, 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 Massachusetts, I don't know. Turns out the answer was simply the, the 13 colonies, uh, which no one who I knew, no Americans actually got. <laughs> uh, but there's a lot of debate. The uh, UK has a new test. They're actually talking about uh, applying the test to legal permanent residents uh, as well. Um, even for, for legal permanent residents, you're seeing many, many more uh, uh, rules. Uh, six biggest European nations recently uh, decided to uh, create an integration contract. So if you want to come and become a legal permanent resident or their equivalent of it, you've got you've to sign this. Um, things also go uh, both directions. Um, Algeria recently uh, granted the right to birthright citizenship to children who were born of Moroccan women who married foreigners. Those children previously did not have the right to citizenship. Um, across Europe, uh, also across the, the United States, uh, there's been an increase in um, discussion of, and in make, many cases, the granting of rights to non-citizens uh, to vote. In the United States, that's mainly in local elections, which to me is an interesting way of bringing things uh, full circle back to the idea of the, the city-state, uh, the idea being a, you know, a citizen is a member of a political body. And uh, a lot of the mun municipalities that are discussing this say, look, by renting a place, by owning a place in this town, you're a member of this city as a political body, very separate from uh, national citizenship uh, and uh, it's actually in our interest uh, to extend rights to these people because it gives them a, a stake in our communities. Uh, it gives them a reason to be involved in trying to better the community uh, for everyone. And that really goes back to the question of the citizenship rights uh, that are afforded, the line between citizens and non-citizens. How do you encourage people to become citizens? How do you how do you not make it so easy to be a, a non-citizen that there's no incentive to become a citizen, but at the same time, how do you come up with the ideal set of, uh, of policies so that everyone who's living in your country, particularly when you have 12% you know, or, you know, there's some countries with 30% with, uh, uh, you know, or more foreign born, how do you ensure that they participate and, uh, and have a stake in getting things better? Um, on the other end, uh, there have been lots of efforts to uh, revoke citizenship, uh, particularly in the case of, of high-profile uh, immigrants um, in the Netherlands, uh, Ayan Hirsi Ali, um, in the Dominican Republic, uh, Sonia Pierre, who's a, an activist for uh, the rights of Haitian migrant workers. There were both um, efforts recently uh, to revoke their citizenship. Um, in very weak states, and this going back to the question of the rights that are afforded to citizens versus those of non-citizens, 
uh, particularly in Africa, in, in very troubled uh, places uh, like Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, you see efforts to try to deny the citizenship of people whose families have been there for generations but are members of ethnic nationalities. Uh, you also have cases like France, something that was very much commented on after the, the riots uh, a couple years ago in Paris, was that many of the people who rioted were actually citizens on paper, like second generation citizens, but they weren't actually putting uh, citizenship into practice. Uh, in this country, you're starting to see more and more uh, accusations, uh, particularly against uh, Latinos, naturalized and otherwise, that they are not citizens. Uh, there was a, a judge, an elected judge in New Mexico recently who was accused very publicly of not being a citizen, even though she was. So it's becoming a, a weapon to attack uh, people who are very much legitimate citizens uh, of their countries. Um, so going forward, I think that there are a lot of questions uh, that certainly in the United States we need to look at and certainly in other countries we need to look at. How do we determine citizenship? Who has the right to it? Uh, there's been a long time uh, uh, struggle between mainly uh, uh, birthright blood citizenship, which is what Germany had until it modified it recently. Uh, there's certainly been some talk in the United States about uh, denying birthright citizenship, uh, particularly to the children of unauthorized uh, immigrants. Uh, or should it be the place of birth? Should you be a citizen of the place that, that you were born? Uh, this is a very important question. There are a lot of pe people who, uh, if, uh, if uh, soil, uh, you know, the, the right of citizenship by soil is uh, taken away, there are a lot of people who may not actually be eligible for citizenship anywhere and end up being stateless. Um, also, what do we do with this, this third category that has uh, really been prevalent since the, the middle of the 20th century. The, uh, depend, depending on where you are in the political spectrum, you're gonna have a different word for it. Um, you know, illegal, uh, undocumented. Uh, somebody pointed out to me that um, people who are here without papers, or they're not actually necessarily without papers, they're not undocumented. They've got more documents than any of you or I do. Uh, so someone proposed fraudulently documented um, the United States, United Nations uh, suggests um, irregular, which suggests to me something you need emodium for. Um, <laughs> so I don't think that's a great word. Um, I think unauthorized is, is what I tend to use, trying to find something that's, that's not uh, so politically charged for either side. In fact, in a lot of talking about migration, I think we could do well to come up with an entirely new set of words uh, you know, some people you say assimilation, people go, oh, you can't say that. Sometimes, sometimes you say multiculturalism. The other side says, no, you can't say that. Um, I tend to use the word pluralism uh, instead, hoping that that's something that uh, the left and the right can both actually have a conversation on it. Um, his, there's the question of how does one earn the right uh, to become a citizen or even to, to legalize. Uh, giving a talk recently in Chicago, uh, I had a question from the audience saying, you know, look at all these, these people who are here illegally. How do we get them to go home? And I said, well, is, is that really the question that you want to ask? Uh, you know, the question that you ask is, is who do we want to be part of our communities? Uh, what are the criteria? If you have someone uh, who has been an active part of the community, contributing, um, upstanding, trying to make things better, um, isn't that the, the criterion that you, you really want to, to use for whether somebody should be uh, here w legally or not, or a citizen or whatever? And I think our real criteria for citizenship need to uh, reflect back on citizenship by Americans. Uh, you look at voter participation rates in this country, which are, are, are dismal. Uh, interestingly, in the 19th century, uh, when more non-citizens were allowed to participate, were encouraged to uh, participate more, uh, uh, you know, voter turnout was you know, 75, 80 percent. Uh, now you have, you know, we're, we're thrilled if we get up to 60 percent in a national election. Uh, you know, local elections, you'll get, you know, the, the 20 to 30 percent, which is, is really quite, quite sad. Uh, you probably saw the recent uh, uh, study by um, Robert Putnam and his, uh, on, on, on diversity suggesting on the one hand that as, uh, as more new people come into a community uh, that uh, participation drops. Interestingly, something that didn't 
uh, didn't get reported as much, although he was, he was quoted on it a number of times, uh, was that as time goes by, uh, this difference uh, erodes, suggesting that people do find a way to incorporate newcomers uh, to their community. But his previous work certainly focused on uh, how Americans are uh, bowling alone, how there's much less um, uh, uh, community participation, and that's, that's a real issue I think we've got to resolve for, for native-born citizens uh, if we're going to properly address how we want to deal with, with newcomers. Um, you know, what are the practical impacts of some of these citizenship policies? Uh, as I mentioned, do our, citizen, our, our citizenship policies uh, encouraging people to naturalize? Uh, are they discouraging them? Um, are our legal systems set up to, uh, to encourage this, this sort of third class uh, of people? Uh, and what are the implications of that? Certainly a lot of the labor groups have, have been very much opposed to guest worker programs uh, that don't provide a path to citizenship for precisely this reason, that they would create a marginalized uh, population. At the same time, the, the question of rule of law is very important uh, to Americans. So how do we come up with a system that respects the rule of law and also uh, encourages uh, everyone who's in this country to, to participate in, uh, in making it a better place? Um, and finally, does, uh, does participation in uh, someone's country of origin uh, help or, or hinder their, their loyalty to their country of origin? Is a passport a piece of paper? Is citizenship uh, something that's that's merely a, a bureaucratic issue, or is it uh, something emotional? Um, I'd suggest that by making a commitment to live in a new country, uh, I think people speak very, very clearly about where their loyalty is. Uh, what is loyalty? Uh, if you come from a country that's a, a dictatorship, uh, you can be certainly loyal to your country, but not to the, the policies of the government of that country. So it's a very, very big uh, difference. Um, there's a, a wonderful book uh, called Citizens in Waiting uh, by Hiroshi Motomura uh, that talks about immigration policy. In the past, uh, immigrants were, were assumed to come, they were citizens in waiting, so all the policies were designed uh, to draw them into society so that they would eventually become citizens. I think we've moved in an opposite direction recently and need to take a very good, look, hard look at, at our role in that, uh, not just uh, blaming immigrants for their status, for their, their naturalization, for their learning English or not. But look at, look at the policies we have uh, that determine whether people are going to learn English or not, whether they are going to naturalize or not, and are those results what we want. Um, and finally, uh, going back to this question of nationality, there's a lot of talk about immigration uh, focused on the U.S. borders and within this country. Uh, but I think if you want to look at the bigger picture of, of who comes in, what drives migration, you've got to look at the countries of origin as well. Uh, I, I speak a lot on MSNBC and in a, in a debate uh, some months ago um, with uh, Jim Gilchrist over the, over the wall, uh, I said, look, you know, we're going to spend $50 billion on a wall uh, when we could use that money towards, towards health care in the U.S., towards, uh, towards teachers. Uh, towards an employer ver verification system uh, that could also be used to go after the, the bad apple employers who use uh, immigration laws as a way to give them sort of license to uh, abuse labor laws. Um, and we could put some of that money towards uh, development in Mexico to some of the towns that you know, don't have uh, proper education, that don't have sewage system, that don't have um, roads to get the, their goods to market. Uh, we could actually invest some of that uh, money in things that would do a lot more uh, to prevent people from walking across the, the desert uh, than just building a wall would. And uh, to my great surprise, um, Jim Gilchrist of the Minutemen came up and said, you know what, um, you know, I, I agree with you. you know, I think there should be a, a Mexican dream uh, just like there is a, an American dream. I, I th think you know, many Mexicans uh, would probably disagree with the idea that there's not a, a Mexican dream. But uh, I think the fact that the two people on very different sides of the debate uh, could agree on, on something like this is very important. And I also think that if you're, uh, if you're going to do this, um, it also shouldn't be a United States goes and tells Mexico what to do. It's a question of 
sitting down with Mexico saying, what are our shared interests? Uh, where's the interdependence here and how can we come up with, with a win-win solution for everybody? And in that sense, uh, you know, the question of uh, nationality becomes one of, of uh, yes, how do you define your border, but also how do you define yourself in relation to uh, cooperation uh, with your neighbor? So I'm afraid I've left you with a lot more questions than answers. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, working on a big project this year on some of these questions, studying some of the citizenship practices uh, around the world that might be unusual to some of us. So hopefully, uh, and particularly with a lot of dialogue, maybe uh, together everyone, everyone can start to come up with, with remotely satisfactory answers to some of these questions. <laughs>